Uh, thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, so full disclosure, I'm not a developer, but I do write code sometimes. And whenever I do, I get a little bit frustrated at the lack of intelligence that some of the development tools uh, uh, show. So uh, nowadays, I can have a conversation with my phone. But if I forget so much as one closing bracket in my source file, it not only does it not compile, but my compiler doesn't give me any hint at all where the error might be. Um, and today, I want to introduce a very exciting research area that has an enormous potential to improve our lives as, as developers, as well as improve the lives of many people who do not know how to code and still need their computers to perform certain tasks for them. And the name of that research area is program synthesis. Um, program synthesis actually is a, a very old dream in computer science. So as soon as computers existed, people started to figure out that programming them is actually very, very difficult. And uh, there was this idea that we could let computers help us do that uh, uh, for us. And so there's this uh, one of the foundational papers of this area uh, by Manna and Waldinger is actually called uh, Synthesis from Dreams to Programs. Now, in a more uh, technical sense, do I have to switch this on somehow? Because it's not doing anything, I'm afraid. Oh, OK, thank you. So program synthesis is about taking a specification, giving that to a smart algorithm, and then the algorithm will come back with a program that matches the specification, that solves this problem for you. And it is correct by construction. That's a crazy idea. So what might such a spe specification look like in a simple case? I could write down a logical formula that says what the minimum of two integers has to satisfy. And then, if everything works correctly, the synthesis algorithm will come back with an implementation of that minimum function, let's say in a general purpose programming language like Python. More generally, there are th three components to a synthesis problem or a synthesis algorithm. The first question is, how do we express user intent? So one option, and the classical option for this, is to write down a, a mathematical formula, a logical formula. But we'll see other ways of doing this very soon. Um, then we have to decide what the space of possible programs is. Um, in this instance, uh, this was a, well, a program in a, any program in a general purpose uh, programming language such, such as Python. And then finally, and I think that's somehow the most mysterious part, there's this question of um, how we can organize search. How do we find the program in the space of possible programs that matches the specification. Um, so one recent uh, development in this area that's very successful is a, a paradigm called programming by examples. So I think what you could already see from this toy example with a, with a minimum function is that um, this classical idea of um, writing down a specification in a mathematical language is very cumbersome. And in certain cases, you can't even do it. Um, so another way of expressing, of capturing user intent is in terms of input-output examples. And one area where this, I think, is really, really uh, nice, where this works really well, is data wrangling. So we already, already had this figure, apparently, um, in a data science project, people spend up to 80% of, of their time just uh, getting the data into the right format. And so I have this toy example here where I copied some uh, um, titles of, of books about artificial intelligence from Wikipedia. And what I'd like to do is to just uh, get the author names there as an output and so forth, and maybe some other uh, information about these books. Now, 
it turns out I can solve this, uh, this task using an advanced uh, data analytics tool. You may have heard of it. Uh, it's called Microsoft Excel. So just a quick show of hands. Who here has actually used Flash Fill? Has nobody used Flash Fill here? It's interesting. Flash Fill, Microsoft Flash Fill? It's a feature of Excel. Maybe if you've used it, I'll just show it. Um, so fair enough, I also usually don't use Excel in my day-to-day -day work. But I think this feature is quite remarkable. So I'm not going to do a live demo. I'm just uh, showing you a recording, and you have to trust me. This is what actually happens if you try this. So I'll this is a bit tough, to be honest. OK. So what I'll do here is just uh, enter the first name and the, uh, or the first name and the, uh, the author of the second book, and then I'll use Flash Fill to get the rest for me. So just enter two examples. And now I also want the year of uh, when this book came out. Again, I use Flash Fill, and it's done. And this is a fairly simple example, but it works equally well in more complicated settings. And I think it's really quite astonishing. Um, and this is based on uh, work by a leading researcher in, in program synthesis named Sumit Gulwani. This was introduced to um, Excel in, I think, 2013. Do you have an? Oh. OK, so I'll try to explain a little bit what, what's going on under the hood there. Um, so let's look at the, the kinds of programs that, uh, that Flash Fill can generate. Um, so I, I'll show you the, the grammar that creates expressions uh, or programs uh, for Flash Fill. There are some, uh, this is slightly simplified, there is uh, some high level conditionals as well that decide depending on what the string looks like, which program to pick. But then it, each individual string program roughly looks like this. You have a, uh, a trace expression, which can be either an atomic string or a concatenation of an atomic string and a, another trace expression. A, an atomic string can either be some constant string or a, a substring, which is uh, defined by two positions. And a position can either be a constant offset uh, or something which is parameterized by two regular expressions and a k. And that's a bit complicated. Essentially, it says look for a, a position with a prefix that matches the first regular expression and a suffix that matches the second regular expression, and then take the kth uh, occurrence of that in my string. OK. So for example, if we wanted to create a, uh, a short string where devs, we would uh, start with a trace expression. That's a concatenation of uh, an atomic expression and another trace expression. And we would uh, just use constant strings for these atomic expressions here. And this is what we call a domain-specific language. So the important uh, idea here is, is this is not a general purpose programming language, but it's specifically designed to solve certain string processing and string manipulation tasks that users typically have to deal with. And, uh, and this really uh, had quite an impact, I think, for people that don't know how to, how to write code. Of course, many of you could write regular expressions that, uh, or small Python scripts that do these tasks, but it's very quick and it's also accessible for people who don't know how to code. So now we've identified two components of this flash fill synthesis uh, process. Uh, we, we communicate user intent through input-output examples, which is fairly easy. And we also have this, um, our space of possible programs is defined by this domain-specific language, which has this grammar. So now the most uh, interesting part, I guess, is how can we search for, uh, given certain input-output examples, how do we search for a, a domain an expression in this domain-specific language, a program that uh, matches these input-output examples? Now, the basic idea is actually fairly simple. 
So now we're given, we're, we have this grammar, and basically, we can just enumerate all of these expressions. So we start with the trace expression, and maybe we guess that we need a concatenation. And then we have these two sub-problems um, that have to uh, generate parts of my output. Um, and in principle, I can just enumerate these expressions whenever I have a, a complete program. I can try it out on my input-output examples, and if it works, I can use that, and if it doesn't work, I'll throw it away. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that um, the, the number of programs here is infinite, and um, this is a very inefficient process if I do it like that. So we have to use some kind of domain knowledge to make the search uh, faster and to, um, to cut off some uh, branches in the search tree, so to speak. And um, I'll try to illustrate that some ideas here using this simple example where the task is to, to extract the initials and to put, put dots there after each letter. Um, so say I'm searching for a program for this, and I'll decide that, well, again, this has to be a concatenation of two substrings. Um, or a concatenation of two strings. So now I've kind of, maybe I decide, uh, so for each concatenation, I have a choice of where to split my, my input string. And let's say I decide uh, to split it just in the, in the middle here, or split, sorry, split the output string. Let's just say I split it just in the middle. And now I have separated this, uh, this uh, task of computing a program that outputs this, uh, these initials into two sub-problems where I um, have to produce parts of the output. Now, if you look at this atomic expression here, um, I don't have the grammar on this screen anymore, but there are only two options here. Either this could be a constant string, and that clearly doesn't work, because whatever I could use just to satisfy this, this first output example, I could just use that constant string, but then it wouldn't work for the other examples, right? Or the second option is that this is a substring uh, that I can cr uh, extract from my input. But it's easy to see that that doesn't work either because I have this, uh, uh, this dot here in the output, which doesn't even occur in the input string at all. So at this point, I know, and this is a very simple observation, but I know that if I want uh, a substring, uh, expression here to solve my problem, well, then the string that I, I have to compute better occur as a substring in my input string. So at this point, I can, I can say, um, this doesn't work. This way of splitting doesn't work, so I, can, I have to try something else. So let's say, instead, I split my output in this way, where I just take the first character and then the rest. And now it's very, very straightforward to uh, find a substring expression that matches this, uh, this output here for this atomic expression. We just take the, the substring that consists of the first character, right? So we've solved this part, and I think we can sort of see that the second part can be solved in a similar way. We have to concatenate again, um, introduce some dots here, and uh, then uh, extract the substring corresponding to the second capital letter, say. OK, so this is a very rough description of how you can uh, enumerate expressions and, and get rid of some of the expressions that you know are not going to uh, lead to a, a successful program. Um, one thing that I haven't uh, mentioned yet is that, um, of course, input-output examples, even though they're a very convenient way of expressing user intent, they typically underspecify the program that you're interested in. So if you just think of this uh, single input-output example, there are many ways that I can create the string devs from developers. One option would be to just take the constant string devs. Well, it works for this input example. Somehow we know that that's not going to be the solution I'm looking for, but just for this example, it's fine. I could take the concatenation of the substrings consisting of the first three characters, followed by the substring consisting of the final character. I could take the concatenation of the substring consisting of the first three characters and a constant s. 
and all sorts of combinations here. Um, so what's, uh, what's a very in, uh, cru crucial idea here for uh, making Flashfill work is that you don't uh, explicitly list all these programs. But instead, um, Flashfill has a way of generating uh, entire sets of programs and of representing them in a compact way that allows you to, to reason about them efficiently. And I'm not going to go into details here, but they, the developers came up with a, a specific data structure they call a, a version space algebra. And then by manipulating such version space algebras, they can reason about potentially thousands, millions of programs efficiently and can generate them. And also, uh, given a set of programs that matches my input-output examples, I then have to decide which, ones, which one I, I use for the other examples, which one the user actually um, wants me to, to output. And for this task, uh, I think internally, Flashflow uses some kind of a machine-based uh, ranking uh, algorithm. OK, so this was uh, for uh, tabular data. Um, there is an extension of this idea implemented in Flashfill to unstructured and, and semi-structured data in a project that was called Flash Extract. And I looked for the Im implementations of this and learned that it's, while it's not really available in this original way, um, it has been integrated into a commandlet called convert from string. Uh, which is part of Microsoft PowerShell. Um, and here, I, have, I just have a kind of a mock example again. Um, I just take the, the task list uh, given by my, my computer at some point that lists all the running processes. And now what I want to do, and I admit this is already fairly, fairly neat, this data, but I, this is just text output. Now, what I want to do is extract uh, a table which contains a column for the process name, um, the process ID, and as well as the, the memory usage. And you can do this by writing a template where you just take part of this uh, output generated by the task list and annotating that in a certain way. So essentially, here we still have the first line of this output, but now I've added a few things here. So I'm saying this, uh, what follows, this uh, sequence of strings, is a, a sequence of process info records. And each process info uh, record contains first a string process name, which in the first uh, line was system idle process, followed by an integer process ID, which was zero in the first case. And then there was some string that I'm not interested in. And then I had a string. In this case, I'm taking a string because I have this K here. Um, which uh, indicated the, well, called memory, which was 8K for the first process. Okay? So I just specify what I want extracted. And now I can just uh, take this template and, um, well, run task list again, give the output to this convert from string commandlet, and uh, it will come back with, a, um, with the data in the right format. So I haven't tried this, but I think you can also get a CSV file or an Excel file if you like. So finally, uh, this has been um, generalized to an entire framework which was called Flash Meta in the literature. Um, is now known under the name Prose. And you can download this uh, from GitHub. Here the idea is that you as a developer can now define your own synthesis algorithm. You specify a domain-specific language in a certain format, plus the semantics. So the semantics would be, say, in the case of Flashfill, you have, you have to define what a substring operation does uh, or a concatenation operation. This will be a few lines of, of code in most cases. Then you also have to define some of these rules about uh, what the output has to set, uh, satisfy, so what I, these arguments that if you have you know, if you want to output a substring, 
um, then the substring has to occur in the input. Some rules that allow you to uh, prune the search space. And these are called witness functions. And you can take these two things and give them to, to the um, uh, meta synthesizer uh, defined by pros. And this will then uh, come back with a synthesizer for your particular task. So you can now say, build your own version of Flash Fill for using pros and get a synthesizer that then takes these input output examples and comes back with a program that satisfies these input output examples. Okay, so that's so much uh, for programming by examples. I think that's a very powerful paradigm, and uh, I certainly encourage you to, to try out uh, pros if you have the chance. So the next thing I want to talk about um, is a bit more experimental, I would say. Um, and this is this idea of sketching. So I don't know about you, but when I write code or write a program, uh, what doesn't happen is the following. I sit down and I think very long and very hard about the problem, what the code should look like, and then I write it down in one go. And it compiles and it solves the problem instantly. So typically, instead, what will happen is that I have maybe a rough, high-level idea of how the program should work, and I write a template of sorts, and then start filling in the details, and at some point realize that it doesn't work the way I had planned to implement this, and I go back to the template, change that a little bit, and iterate a few times until I get it right. And now the idea would be um, to really just write a high-level sketch of your program that has some holes, some gaps in it, and give it to the synthesizer along with a couple of requirements that you specify. You just tell, tell the synthesis algorithm, OK, this is what I want, roughly. Well, figure out the details for me. And the synthesizer will then come back with, with the details and the, the source code implementing the full program. Now, this idea has been implemented in the sketch system by Solar Lezama, which is available from the MIT website. And sketch has a, a C-like uh, syntax uh, plus, it has this uh, notion or this syntax for leaving a hole in your program. So these two question marks indicate um, that there is some constant to fill in. And this can be, typically it's an integer, but it can also be a Boolean value or even a, a constant size array. And now I have a very simple example where I'm saying I want to write a function that uh, triples uh, the input argument, and I don't know how to do that. But now I can combine this with what's called a test harness. I can say, OK, my implementation of this function is supposed to satisfy certain cases or cer certain requirements. And I can write them down just as assertions uh, in a similar way as in, in C or C++. And so I'd say, OK, I want a function that if I call it on value 3, I get 9. If I call it on value 2, I get 6. And on value 0, I get 0. And sure enough, if I give this to sketch, it will tell me, well, you have to insert 3 there. That's the right constant. So this is very simple, but already with this, you can do somewhat interesting things. So in this next example, um, I don't know if you are aware of this. Uh, usually, if you, if you swap two variables, you need a third temporary variable to store one of the variables. Turns out in, in C, or if you have bitwise operations, you can actually do this without introducing an auxiliary variable. And let's say I remember this trick, and I even know that it needs three, a sequence of three XOR operations. And it so happens that I can't look it up on Wikipedia because my internet is down, but I do have Sketch installed. So in that case, I could write down a sketch like that, which says, OK, in the first line, pick one of these two operations. Second line, pick one of these two. And third line, pick one of these two. And then I, I define my test harness, which says, OK, for any 
So this is a, these are all bit vectors of uh, size 32. And now I say, OK, for any pair of bit vectors, if I give it to the swap function, well, it will swap them correctly. So what was, what, what was x before will now be y and vice versa. And now I can give this to Sketch again. And Sketch will tell me, oh, here's your implementation. These are the three instructions that you need in order to, to swap these two bit vectors. So in order to, to create more complicated programs, you have to introduce a, we have to introduce the concept of a generator, which is like a function, except that it gets partially inlined. And uh, I can, using this function I can, or this generator, I can get multiple instances of, of a function. So for instance, if I want to generate a couple of different versions of this multiplication uh, function, um, I could uh, use a generator here which says, uh, okay, well, my function here multiplies the input with some constant. And then I can write a test harness um, which says, okay, I want, actually want three different functions now. I want one where if I uh, input three, I get nine as a return value. If I input two, I get four as a return value. And one where if I input one, I get zero as a return value. And then if I give this to Sketch, it will give me these three instantiations, which, sure enough, um, satisfy these constraints. So that's very, very simple again. But with this, you can do um, fairly interesting things because you can define recursive generators. So in this next example, what I'll, I'll try to do is define actually all bit vector expressions up to a certain depth. And I'll just uh, write the, uh, show this here. So um, given an, an input bit, bit, bit vector and a bound and the depth, um, well, a, what expressions can I generate? I can return the bit vector itself. I can return some other constant bit vector. I can recursively call this generator, which, you know, decreasing the bound by one, giving me a, a bit vector expression, and I can negate the result. And then finally, and there's some additional syntactic sugar there, I can um, the return, okay, well, I can recursively call the generator uh, twice and combine the outputs by or and or a, a bitwise xor. And I can now use this to solve certain problems. So in this example, um, the task is to, given a bit vector, what I want to find here is the, well, the rightmost zero. Let's say this is indexed from zero to, to w, if I have bit vectors of width w. Um, and so what I want to do is I just uh, find this bit here and return a bit vector which has everything else set to zero and this bit set to one. And this, of course, you can implement with a loop in a very straightforward way. You don't have to read the code here. What happens is you just go through uh, this bit vector from right to left. The first time you see a zero, which is here, um, well, you, you, you initially have some constant zero bit vector. Once you find a one, you set the uh, bit vector at that location to one and return the result. So that's a fairly simple example. But what you can also do now, and that's where, where Sketch comes in, is you can define this, or you can implement this function using a constant number of bit vector operations, which is somewhat counterintuitive. But I can just write down um, this expression here, saying, OK, I now want a function which implements this task, and it's uh, generated essentially by this uh, bit vector expression of depth up to three. So here, all possible, um, all possible programs uh, that I'll allow are defined by these uh, bit vector expressions, ands, xors, negations. And if I, if I give this uh, to Sketch, indeed I get back a solution to this problem, which uh, allows me to, to do this task without a loop and just these, this 
sequence of bit vector operations. So I start out with a constant bit vector which has the leftmost bit set to 1. And then I perform an XOR with the input and an AND with a negation of the input. And again, this is somewhat of a toy example, of course. But I, I think what it shows is that synthesis can come up with uh, programs that are highly uh, non-intuitive and difficult to come up with, even for experts. So I have a few more um, showcases that I want to talk about. One is this uh, about this notion of super-optimization, which is kind of what we had in this last example, where you, you start out with, a, with an implementation of your, of your program. Um, so something, a program you already have, and that's going to be your specification in this case. So you already know how the problem can be solved, but you want to perform some optimization. You now want, you now want an implementation that maybe is shorter or faster. And so the idea here is that you're, you give this program that you already have to the synthesizer, and then let it search for alternative implementations that are equivalent, that do the exact same task, but are somewhat more efficient. And so in this paper from 2013, they used a, an interesting new technique called stochastic search, uh, where they take, uh, take a program, uh, look at the abstract syntax, syntax tree, and then say, OK, at this point, I'm going to swap my my operation for something else. And then hopefully, if that works, uh, I can do this multiple times and in the end come up with a, a different implementation of the same program that's faster. And indeed, in experiments, they were able to, um, to take um, code and find optimized versions. So what they compared with, I think they started out with, uh, so it had some program compiled without optimizations. That was the start. And then they would run the synthesis algorithm and compare the output with uh, GCC with all optimizations turned on. And um, I think in many cases, the, the, the process wasn't, um, so it was maybe um, took twice as long as just taking the compiler with optimizations, but reasonably fast. And also the code that it generated was, in all cases, uh, as fast or at least as fast as the code given by the compiler, but in some cases it was uh, faster by up to a factor of 1.6. And this shows that synthesis algorithms, especially for, for small programs, are able to come up with, with solutions that even experts have uh, difficulty to, to uh, derive. Now here's another example that I, that I like because it kind of turns the thing on its head a bit. Um, so if you think about malware, um, malware, if you look at the code, it's usually uh, written in a very weird way so that you can't figure out what it actually does. So it's obfusc obfuscated. And uh, I think nowadays, usually experts have to look at the code and kind of figure out what it, what's going on there. And it turns out that you can use synthesis to partially solve this task. So in this case, your, your specification would be the obfuscated program. So that's something that you're not quite sure what it does. And the task for the synthesis algorithm is to um, come up with an alternative, a different implementation that's simpler. And so you can take this obfuscated code, give it to the synthesis algorithm, and it will come back with a simpler version that you can actually read and interpret. Okay, finally, one last example, and I just uh, saw this uh, the other day. Um, and I sh at this point, I, I should probably say I'm not affiliated with Microsoft in any way. They just happen to have a very strong synthesis research group and uh, try to turn the research into products. Um, so they, there's this paper about on-the-fly edit suggestions. So as the user is editing their program or their text file or their, their spreadsheet, um, this uh, blue pencil algorithm um, looks at these changes and tries to detect, detect patterns in it. And it will then suggest changes that are similar and try to figure out other changes that you, you need to make. And this is something you can actually try out now. 
It's uh, a preview, preview feature in IntelliCode. And uh, I think you just have to go to the settings somewhere and turn on the refactoring support um, for C Sharp. So currently, I think it's only, only available for C Sharp. And that already brings me to my final slide. So I tried to do, introduce this uh, uh, exciting research area of program synthesis, which is about generating programs from user intent. And the important thing here is that these programs are correct by design, right? Um, we saw some instantiations of that. I think there are areas where, where um, these, uh, the tools are very mature already, such as data wrangling. I also think the super optimization um, is, a, is a, an application that works very well. So if you have a small piece of code that you want optimized, um, you can try to let a synthesis algorithm come up with a more efficient implementation. There are several other areas that I think are very promising. So the sketching, assuming that it, it, it scales further, uh, I think is really going to be very convenient if you can just write down a high-level sketch of your program and let the synthesizer figure out the details. There are many other things that I, I didn't talk about. Uh, there are some ideas for generating SQL queries from text. Um, and uh, yeah, many more applications. Now, if you want to try some of this or get a bit into the area, um, there's an excellent survey from 2017, so it doesn't include the newest stuff, um, by Gurvani, Porozov, and Singh. So this I, I can recommend. Um, if you really want to understand the underlying techniques, there is an, an excellent online lecture, so it's available in terms of just, just a, a website with lecture notes. Uh, and uh, this really explains, I think this is from 2018, explains many of the main ideas in a very, very accessible way. And finally, if you just want to try this out yourself, um, I would again recommend, recommend you check out the pros website, which has many uh, examples, and uh, you can run them yourself play around with the domain-specific language, et cetera. And uh, now I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Friedrich. So can we switch to the slide? Oh, slide. OK, so now we have some questions. I'm sure it's, I, I think it was a very fascinating talk. And now I finally, I think, understand what program synthesis means. Um, all right, so the first question, what mm -hmm. about cases I don't want the system to learn, like anti-cases? Yes, excellent question. Um, you don't, uh, there's a way of, of generalizing this. And actually, in prose, um, you can go beyond input-output examples and actually uh, come up with what's called an, I think it, they call this an inductive specification which in particular, you just kind of describe what the output has to look like. You just uh, say, OK, well, you could say, for instance, I want this input-output example. Mm -hmm. But you can also, in particular, say, oh, I don't want this to be the output for, for this mm -hmm. particular input. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, can say um, many more things using this. OK. Yeah. OK. Interesting. All right, so the next question. If you consider code as a specification, what is the difference between everyday programming and program synthesis? Well, except in the, uh, in the cases that, uh, that I showed at the end, I mean, usually the, the idea is that you don't actually have an implementation uh, in terms of code yet. So if you have that, in many cases, you're, you're fine. You can still use program synthesis to perhaps optimize the code in certain ways. But uh, I think if you, uh, if, the, if you already have an implementation, that's, uh, that's good, right? Mm -hmm. so, I mean, the idea, of course, is to make things like sketching uh, um, scale so that you actually don't have to write mm -hmm. the complete code yourself, but you can just kind of tell the program what you want. Maybe even, um, and there are some attempts to just uh, do this in terms of natural language, mm -hmm. and then the, the synthesizer will uh, do this for you. That will be so. an amazing future. Mm -hmm. OK. <clears throat> can you talk a bit more about the text to SQL? Where, where can we mm. learn more about it? Uh, I think, uh, so I don't know too much about this. The idea there was that um, so this is kind of a, a mix of uh, uh, 
let's say, deep learning and uh, synthesis, mm -hmm. where, um, so if you just let a, a deep learning network, so the idea is that you, you have some text, and uh, you know some SQL queries, and you train a neural network on these pairs of text and SQL query. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, then you'll, you've trained the network to, some, to a point where you can um, say, give it a new example, then it will come up with some sequence of characters. Mm -hmm. Now, in most cases, this is not going to be uh, uh, a SQL query or not something that, that actually works. It's just something the neural network came, came up with. Mm -hmm. And you can't be sure it actually is syntactically correct. And then what you do is instead try to, um, so you try to get rid of these cases that are, um, so you look at the output of the neural network. And when it's not uh, syntactically correct, you throw it away and say, OK, uh, do something else instead. And um, so I think if you just Google for text to SQL, you will find uh, some papers in this direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and if you um, come talk to me later, I can, I can also come up with the, with the paper on this. Perfect. Yeah, so like always, if you have any further questions that you think would be too deep to ask here, then always come up to Friedrich after the talk. He'll be here around the stage, and you can ask him further questions. So I think we have time for three more questions. Let's pick one. What are the use cases outside research papers? Oh, come on. I <laughs> <laughs> so maybe for sketching, fair enough. That's still a prototype. <laughs> but um, I mean, this is programming by examples as part of uh, Excel. Um, and uh, so I think for data wrangling, this is really a good idea. Maybe you. Uh, you can't do everything just by uh, these, these inductive specifications, but you can use that in combination with a few scripts. So I really think that that's a use case um, outside research papers. Definitely, and maybe also in the bit very beginning, it could be for educational purposes. Oh, to oh that's get something. People um, who are not uh, familiar with programming to get them into it, et cetera, et cetera. Which reminds me, if I may, um, there, there are some interesting applications of this that don't have anything to do with. Uh, well, synthesis in this, in this sense, mm -hmm. uh, it's been used to, for programming education. Mm -hmm. So it will kind of grade, I think, papers on um, edX, the platform, this online learning platform. Mm -hmm. When you have programming exercises, they use synthesis to kind of automatically grade, the pay, uh, grade your solutions and also indicate where the error might be. Mm -hmm. So that's an, I think it's a very cute application of Definitely. A synthesis. Definitely, and that will also mean that we'll be, be able to learn even more new languages even faster. How great. So uh, you only talked about serialized code, seemingly. Um, what about optimizing serial code towards parallelized? Parallelization. Mm, I, OK, I don't know from the top of my head. I'm pretty sure there is work on this. Also because uh, I think usually people in the synthesis area like functional programming languages because they are very suited for, for synthesis. Mm. And I guess they're also quite uh, useful for parallelizing code. Mm -hmm. um, I think there should be work on this, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. You can definitely look it up later, and we can talk with Friedrich later if you've asked that question. Last question, which one should we take? First one. I the would first like one. Isn't one. this already done in compiler optimization? Yes, to some extent. That's, very, that's correct. So I think there the boundary is somewhat unclear. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to some extent, even uh, an optimizer that, um, a compiler that optimizes very aggressively, um, we still expect the compiler to uh, look for certain or generate code in a certain uh, predetermined way. But yes, for very aggressive optimizations, this is similar. I would say that usually in, in synthesis, there's more of an emphasis on, on search for programs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I think there, there are some similarities, definitely. Perfect. OK, so that was it. Please give a big round of applause to Friedrich. Thank you.